I won't be using my name, or revealing exactly where I live, in case this comes back to bite me. But I will say this took place in California. Not so long ago now, I started using this site that catered to pretty much every fetish you can think of. Some obviously more popular than others. But if you could think of it, there were probably at least a few people in the community who were interested in it too. I came across a lot of these different groups on the site. s and that's a given. Guys who got off to girls stuck in fake quicksand, that one I'll never understand. Adults pretending to be babies, eyeball licking, vor, sex with the elderly, sex with clowns, and of course, the dreaded furries. The one that really tickled my pickle though was leather. I ended up meeting a girl on the site who was into the same thing, and we actually met for coffee. It went well. So well, in fact, that we met up for a few drinks later that week. Her name was Zoe. She looked a little older in real life than in her pictures, but that's usually the case, and she was still very much my type. During the second date, I noticed this table of four guys who kept staring over at the two of us. I mentioned this to Zoe, but she didn't seem to think it was a big deal. They looked a little rough around the edges, but I put it to the back of my mind. Anyway, we both ended up getting a little drunk, and she offered for me to go back to her place. Frankly, I was too far gone at that point, and wouldn't have been able to do anything even if I wanted to. So, to her surprise, I actually declined. She seemed aggravated by the fact I said no. I guess she just thought all guys said yes to an invitation like that. In hindsight, she got a bit too angry about the whole thing. But she cooled off pretty quickly, and I selectively forgot about it. The glory of alcohol. In all honesty, I was surprised that this fetish website had led to me sort of dating a girl. I figured it would all be about hookups and one night flings, but Zoe and I actually organised a third date. I sent her a message about getting dinner, but she messaged me saying we should skip it and get straight to the drinks. Alright, fine by me. The night started well enough. I arrived late, but Zoe looked particularly happy to see me. You smooth dog, I thought to myself. She was wearing a pair of tight leather pants. Very nice, if I do say so myself. I planned on pacing my alcohol consumption better that night, expecting another invitation from Zoe to head back to her place. I didn't plan on whiskey dicking two times in a row. I order a beer and drink it slowly. Around ten minutes in, I spot those same four guys from last time over in the corner. I'm sure it was them. This was a completely different bar in a different part of town. Could have just been a coincidence, but I didn't like the way they kept throwing the occasional glance our way, just like the time before. Sometimes you just know something isn't right, and this was one of those times. I mentioned it again to Zoe, and we shared a laugh that those guys must be stalking us or something. We chat and flirt for around an hour, when I start to feel a little lightheaded. That's strange. At this point, I've barely drunk anything. This woozy feeling intensifies little by little, and I start to realise something's wrong. I excuse myself, and by the time I make it to the bathroom, the stalls are spinning. I fumble my way inside one of them, and force myself to vomit in the toilet. I knew what had happened. I'd been drugged. But when, and with what? I managed to call the only person I knew would help me without question, my pal Jeff. Slurring my words, I'd tell him the bar name and say I need an evac pronto. I count my lucky stars that I made that call when I did, because a few minutes later, I was so far gone I don't remember a thing. Jeff relayed to me what happened next. When Jeff arrived, I was being carried out of the bar by Zoe and some random guy. Neither appeared concerned, 
they were more like determined, on a mission. According to Jeff, they led me over to a van where a few other guys were waiting and were preparing to put me in the back of it. When he described the guys to me as best he could, I knew who he was talking about. Those same rough looking guys who had been staring at Zoe and I the entire evening and the time before. These hadn't been a set of dates, they'd been a set of traps. Zoe and the glancers were in cahoots. That explains her anger on the second meetup. She must have told those guys where she was going to take me, and was planning on leading me into an ambush. This time she wasn't taking any risks, and wanted to make sure I went along with them. She must have spiked my drink when I went to the bathroom or something. The bitch. Jeff gets out of the vehicle and rushes over, telling them he knows exactly what's going on and that he's going to call the police. He took their license plate number and pictures of the whole group with his phone. A couple of the guys start to get aggressive towards him, and Zoe's there screaming at him to fuck off, but Jeff manages to keep his cool. When a couple of late night passers-by come along, the group lost their nerve and dumped me in the middle of the road, leaving it to Jeff to scoop me up and get me to a hospital. They took off in the other direction. I woke up in the morning with the worst headache of my life, but other than that, I was going to be fine. I gave the cops as much information as I could about Zoe, but they couldn't find a trace of her on the site, and nothing ever came of it. Knowing Jeff, I'm sure he made it sound more heroic than it really was, but I have to be honest, he really saved my ass that night. I mean, what would have happened to me if he arrived just one or two minutes later? Jeff thinks human trafficking, but I'm not so sure that happens to guys all too often. I guess it's a possibility. Another friend of mine thinks they wanted to make a snuff movie. In theory, it could have been any number of things, especially when you consider they found me through a fetish website. Personally, I don't like to think too much about it. Guys, I think I fucked up. I could use some advice. It all started when I broke up with my ex one year ago. Her name was Haruka. Haruka was really kind, which was why I started dating her in the first place. But she was also really pessimistic, and as such, it was no fun to hang around with her. She was the kind of low spirit that made everyone around her depressed too including me. You know the type of person I'm talking about. I think she had a borderline personality disorder. I only really noticed her weird traits when we started dating. Every time I'd finish talking on the phone, she'd keep asking me whom I'd been talking to. If ever I didn't respond straight away, she'd ask me over and over again, and wouldn't stop querying me until I answered. Most times I said it was my parents, and it really was. I could see it in her eyes that she didn't really believe me though. During the weekends, it was a given that I would have to spend my time with her. I'm talking every minute of it. When I was away from town due to work, she'd call me up every hour on the hour. She'd also request evidence that I'd actually been at work. Essentially, Haruka was a control freak. She made sure I had no privacy whatsoever. I think she would have controlled the way I shit and piss if she had the chance. She also started saying really disturbing things to me. Things like, If you ever leave me for another girl, you know that I'd kill you, right? I realized that this wasn't normal, but I was still in love with her at the time. At one point though, I decided enough was enough. I went to see her parents without telling her to try and sort out her problem, but before I could even discuss it with them, they started saying things like, Our daughter's been really depressed over the past few years. She's been in such a bad place ever since she was dumped by her last boyfriend. 
I'm glad she managed to find a good young man like you. She's in a much better place now. I hadn't even seen her laughing until these past few months. Thank you so much. Her mother was seriously in tears before I could bring it up. It was surreal. I ended up saying everything was fine, and left with a newfound enthusiasm to make it work with her. But it didn't last. Her need for control got worse as the days passed by. Towards the end, any conversation with other girls became completely forbidden. When I mentioned I was arranging a work get-together with some female colleagues, she deleted their phone numbers off my phone. Even casual greetings with neighbours was disallowed if they were a female. At restaurants, if the person bringing out the menus was a waitress, Haruka would be the one to order. She wouldn't even let me look in the girl's direction. I couldn't do this anymore. It didn't matter if she had come from a bad place or not. This just wasn't how human beings were meant to live. I think I would have gone mad if I stayed with her any longer. I went to Haruka's apartment early one weekend. Maybe you'll think I'm a freak when I say this, but I actually scripted out how I was going to break the news to her. I made sure the breakup would be as kind as possible. I sighed a breath of relief when I finished talking. I looked up to see her staring at the floor. I couldn't see the expression on her face at all. Not wanting to make her cry, I turned to leave with an, I'm really sorry. But as I got up, she suddenly reared her head upwards, and with a massive shriek, shouted, How dare you? Her face had contorted into a devilish sneer. It wasn't sadness in her eyes at all. It was fury. She looked at me as though she was looking at a cockroach, her contempt for me as clear as day. Before I had a chance to even open my mouth, she grabbed hold of my shirt and threw me to the ground with an almost otherworldly strength. She then ran off into the kitchen, shrieking all the way. Terrified and lost for words, I bolted out of the door, leaving my shoes behind, all the while hearing her shout things like, You don't deserve to live, you disgusting degenerate. I'm going to cut your fucking throat. And the ever-reliable, if I can't have you, no one can. I realized that the situation was dire. She had entered the kitchen to fetch herself a weapon. She most likely just wanted to threaten me. But of course, I couldn't be sure. Biting my lips in the hallway, I waited for the elevator doors to open. But as they were about to, with a soft groan, I saw Haruka burst out from her room just ten meters away. Her door opened with such speed and force, it was almost as if she had broken right through the damn thing without opening it. The intensity in her eyes... She was like a woman possessed. As soon as I saw that, I knew that she didn't simply want to threaten me with the knife in her hand. She really did want to slit my throat. Crying out in shock, I left the elevator and stumbled for the stairs to my left. Her apartment was on the fifth floor, but I had no choice. She would have killed me if I waited there for the elevator to open. I know that much for certain. I ran down the stairs as fast as I could, but somehow her voice behind me seemed to be getting louder and louder. Screams of, I'll kill you, mixed in with unintelligible shouting. I got to the ground floor and was about to bolt for my car when I stopped. I looked behind me and back at my car. In a split-second decision, I instead hid behind the shadow of the stairs and waited for her. A decision that to this day, I believe saved my life. Instinctively, I realized that by the time I got to my car, opened the door and turned on the ignition, I would have been pounced on. She had been catching up with me, and I could tell by the volume of her screams that she was only one floor away. So... Terrified, I waited. 
I heard the screams and thumping of feet getting louder and louder. I bided my time, and wished with all my heart that this plan would work. I then jolted my leg forward in front of the stairs. I felt my leg connect with her shin with a painful crack. With a yell of surprise, she tripped, or more accurately, flew into the air in front of her. She crashed face first into the ground with a resounding thud, which seemed to echo around the foyer. My god, I didn't think she'd fall into the trap that well. She must have really lost her mind, so much so that she wasn't paying much attention to her surroundings. I quickly shuffled to the safety of my car and peered at her cautiously. She was still on the ground. Maybe I should call an ambulance, I thought to myself. I could see her moving, however, and I distinctly saw other doors opening as the neighbours peered out to see what the commotion was. No doubt that if she told them what happened, they'd now take her side. Honestly, I didn't want to have anything to do with her at that stage. I just wanted her out of my life as soon as possible. I know it was a dick move but I left her there. I drove to the entrance and floored it. I moved apartments after that. I told all of my colleagues at work not to give my new address away to anyone, and explained the full details of what had happened. I didn't notify the police, though. I was afraid she might sue me for what I had done, or even press criminal charges of her own. No doubt I'd come away looking like the bad guy, but you have to believe me when I say I know she would have killed me in that building if given the chance. Anyway, all's well that ends well, right? Wrong. A few days ago, I got a letter in the mail. There was nothing written on the envelope, and there was no stamp. It was clear that someone had posted the letter by hand, I opened the letter to find a single, folded piece of A4 paper. On it was only one sentence. I will always be waiting for you. At the bottom was a kiss mark in red lipstick. And there it is. She's found me. What do you think I should do? Was that letter a threat? A promise? I know it's her. And I'm scared. When I was about 12, my great uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this was the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point, and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station, and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about having a place to stay and some food to eat an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her place, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when travelling in this part of the USSR, and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he was glad to accept her offer. He took his suitcase, and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside, and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. It was the first time John was able to see the woman clearly, and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. 
not wanting to pry and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, they said good night, and she closed the door. Then she locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, Jong called to her, but she didn't answer, and he heard nothing. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning, and that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee, and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees, and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. Instead, he found a body. Great Uncle John went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to get out that way, there was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. Then he got under the bed, and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs, and then towards the room. The lock clicked, and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone move towards the bed, he heard several terrific and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they had then dropped on the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out of the room, and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs, and then once more, silence. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out, then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury, and began to run into a field behind the house, towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway, with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would be the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God that he escaped, and decided that the next time he travelled to visit relatives, he'd take another way. Hidden away in the rich part of town is my cafe. The luscious interior of the cafe, along with the relaxing jazz music that we play, make this a popular joint for students and housewives with too much free time on their hands. There's even a terrace, which is often filled with people reading books, chatting and drinking coffee. Sometimes something a little stronger. It was November, and a trio of young girls entered the cafe. They'd been allowed to leave school early due to finishing their midterm exams that day. They were complaining about how they went. Well, this is shit. Jesus, I'm gonna have to repeat a year. Oh, come on, you couldn't have done that badly. I've never heard of a student repeating a year at 14. A fresh batch of squabbling ignited, fueled by the stress of exams and the annoying air of confidence one of the girls was giving off. She was obviously the smarter of the bunch. The nattering subsided after ten minutes, and eventually, the girls settled on a new topic of conversation. Namely, what schools they were planning to progress to. 
In the Japanese schooling system, high schools are commonly split between Chugaku, which is lower secondary, and Kou Kou, upper secondary. What Kou Kou you attend can greatly affect your chances of getting into a good university. Still eavesdropping in on their conversation, the two, well, less gifted students started teasing the smarter one, telling her how the best school in the district, the one she would likely be going to, was haunted. The rumour was a famous one. Apparently, after a student committed suicide at the school, other pupils started to die horrible deaths on the school premises. Witnesses often swore that they saw the dead student at the scene of the crimes. What a load of shit. It wasn't uncommon that people claim places where suicides occurred were haunted. In fact, in Japan, you can find an apartment at a comparatively cheaper price if uh, misfortunes occurred there. Losing interest, I was about to turn away and tend to my duties, when I heard a shout. Now wait just a minute, the voice said. Turning towards its source, I realised it was one of the ladies sitting on the opposite end of the cafe. The woman left her book on the table and walked over to the three young girls. Sitting down with a grunt, she scratched at her long dark hair rigorously. For that brief interval, everything in the cafe seemed to revolve around this little strange woman in a red dress. Then she opened her mouth to speak. I am sick and tired of all of these lies about my old school being haunted. If you three would be so kind as to stop spreading such idiotic rumours, I'd be more than happy to tell you what actually happened there. I couldn't help but listen in to this whole story from behind my counter. I was just as interested in finding out the truth behind the rumours as these three young girls. The story itself wasn't about this quirky woman in the red dress though. It was about another girl that she knew at the school called Akasuki. For the purposes of this video, I'll retell the story I overheard from Akasuki's perspective. I have an older twin sister. I sometimes get asked things like, do you feel pain when your sister gets hurt? Do your parents get confused between the two of you? Stuff like that. People seem to have this idea that twins are connected somehow on a deeper level, more so than regular siblings. But not us two. We didn't hate each other per se, but we didn't really care for one another either. We never argued talked, or interfered with each other's affairs. We might as well have been thin air to each other. Now, my sister was much more able than me when it came to, well, pretty much anything. Athletics, academics. Okay, it wasn't like she was miles ahead of me, but she was always slightly better. Even when the difference was so small, from a young age I was constantly deemed as the less able one sometimes even the simpleton. During childhood, my arsehole parents would always say things like, your sister can already ride her bike, why can't you? I probably learnt it about 20 minutes after her, but this small amount might as well have been the difference between heaven and earth. If I scored 95% on a math test, I never got a pat on my back from the teacher, or even just a reassuring, well done. No. I'd be sitting by myself with my paper, staring at my sister being championed by the class for getting 98%. But then again, I didn't really envy my sister, and she didn't brag about being better. Like I said, we were pretty much just heir to each other. As implied by my past grades in school, we were both top of the league. There were times where our exam results were first and second in the whole school, so it was only natural that we ended up going to the same high school. That was the best high school in the district. Our relationship didn't change during high school. I actually enjoyed it there, but only for the first semester. Even in a school full of students who scored top grades, there were bullies and rebels. Problem was, these bullies were smart. Whenever they carried out their evil deeds, they'd make sure it wouldn't be found out by their peers or by faculty members. 
even when they were found out. They generally got off the hook due to their excellent grades. Because obviously, straight-A students can't be evil, can they? It started when I came back from the summer break. The bullying, that is. For some reason, they started paying attention to me at school. I don't know what I'd done, but there was nothing that I could do. During lunch, or after school, they'd come to my classroom. Then they'd take me to some inconspicuous location, and punch me, kick me, hit me. Like I said, they were clever. They made sure to avoid bruising my face or arms. There were five bullies in total. One of them was a girl with chestnut-coloured hair, who just watched as three others pummeled me senseless. She just pointed and laughed while giving the other girls orders. She was obviously the leader. There was also one other girl who came along to watch the show. My sister. It didn't make sense to me. My sister hated these types of girls just as much as I did. After ignoring each other for so long, why would she try and break me now? I'd only known the friends I'd made at the school for three months. As soon as they found out I was being attacked by the rogues of the school, they almost immediately stopped hanging out with me, fearful that they'd be targeted simply for associating with me. In the end, I found myself alone at school. The violence continued for months and months. They started getting more creative in the ways they'd hurt and humiliate me. The worst days were when their chestnut-haired leader was in a bad mood. Sometimes I was stripped naked and thrown into a pond. When I fell to my knees out of breath, she'd grab me by the hair and pull me up to my feet. Not yet, Chestnut would say, and the violence would continue. All the while, my sister would be staring at me coldly, without a flicker of emotion on her face. It was as if she was staring at a rat or a cockroach. I couldn't tell what she was thinking. I thought about telling my parents, but they already had plenty to worry about with their work. Besides, they'd almost certainly take the side of their favoured daughter. My sister must have started bullying me in the first place because she knew I wouldn't talk. There was nothing I could do about the situation. If I told my teachers, there was a chance the bullying would just get worse. It was possible the teacher would think I was lying, particularly considering that the bullies were perfect students during lessons. There was absolutely nothing, nothing that I could do. Every day when I got home, I'd desperately try and clean the bloodstains off my shirt before my parents came home. I sobbed as I furiously rubbed my shirt. What had I done to deserve this? One time, while I was scrubbing, I heard my sister coming up the stairs. She must have got back from her part-time job early. I pictured her face, cold as ice, staring at me as the bullies beat me over and over again. How could it be that she was enjoying her life at school so much when I was in this state? She was part of the tennis club, had a part-time job, and lots of friends. Why did my life have to be so terrible? We were twins. I ended up hating my sister more than the other bullies, simply because she was enjoying her life so much. The violence just kept on intensifying. One time I nearly died from drowning, because I was just too tired and injured to resist as they dunked my head underwater. I was tired. I could only think of one way out. I began my preparations. I wrote a note with just four words. Mum. Dad. I'm sorry. Slowly, step by step, I walked up the stairs of the school. Nobody was allowed to be there after 9pm, so there were no teachers or other students around. But since I knew the school well, it wasn't difficult to break inside. I finally got to the top of the stairs. There was a metal door leading to the rooftop. I swung it wide open. It was winter at this point, and a cold breeze hit me straight away and chilled me to the bone. There was a full moon, 
and I could clearly see the whole rooftop area. My sister was already there, just as I had asked her to be, waiting with her back to the door. I hadn't expected her to come. She was leaning on the rails of the roof, staring down at the school grounds below. I walked towards her. I wanted to talk to you in private. I figured school would be the best place. Surprisingly, my sister replied straight away. I guess. This was the closest thing we'd had to a conversation for as long as I could remember. I stepped closer to my sister as she continued to talk. So, what did you want to talk about? Without hesitation, I threw myself at her. She had her back to me, and I caught her completely off guard. My sister flew into midair and fell downwards off the roof, down and out of sight. After seeing the suicide note that I'd placed in my sister's room, nobody suspected foul play. My sister hardly ever spoke to anyone, hardly ever laughed. It seemed perfectly plausible that she had been depressed and taken her own life. That was the beauty of my plan. Maybe with my sister gone, the four other bitches who'd been making my life hell would now lose interest in tormenting me. If that happened, I'd finally be able to get on with my life, go back to being a normal student again. From the time of my sister's death and her funeral, it had already been a few weeks. Feeling nervous, I stepped back into my classroom. All of my classmates ignored me, except for one girl, the leader of the bullies, the girl with chestnut hair. She smiled and winked at me. Hey, are you alright? she asked. I was taken aback by this display of compassion from her. Although my heart was now beating faster than it ever had, I made sure not to show it. I remained expressionless. I'm fine. It's not like I cared about her. Even though I said this, I had been feeling extremely remorseful. Yes, we were like heir to each other, but she had been my twin sister. The bully nodded and smiled again. Hey, that's great. So you're gonna find a part-time job now, I guess. That was strange. Why was she talking about a part-time job all of a sudden? I couldn't hide my surprise, and she laughed when she saw my confusion. <laughs> what? Did you think we'd take pity on you? If you want us to stop, you're gonna have to make a contract, just like your sister did. What the hell was she talking about? The bully looked genuinely surprised that I didn't know what she meant, that my sister had never told me what she had done. She really never told you, huh? <laughs> we were bullying your sister at the start. Had nothing to do with you. We only stopped fucking with her because she agreed to pay us off. <laughs> Told her we'd find a new victim instead. Oh, I still remember her face when we said we'd picked you. She told me how much I'd have to pay her and her lackeys to stop this torment. Then she patted me on the shoulder and with another wink said, Good luck from today. We've already found a new target instead of you. Provided you pay us on time, that is. Now I understood everything. Why the girls had started to bully me when I hadn't even met them before. Why my sister was always with them. Why my sister had been leaning against the rooftop rails with her back to me. As if she was asking me to push her. Maybe she had been in greater pain than me all along. In that moment... I blanked out. Next thing I remember, I'm being hauled into a police car by two armed cops. I was absolutely covered in blood. The human body is a very fragile thing. It's amazing the damage you can do to somebody with just one pen. And that was the story of Akasuki, as told by the woman in the red dress. I couldn't help but interrupt the story as I brought her another cup of coffee. How did she know all of this? It turned out that the woman in red had been a friend of Akasuki's, at least before she started getting bullied. To avoid unnecessary trouble, she had stopped hanging out with her, 
but after she found out what had happened, she felt extremely guilty. Akasuki had been placed in a psych ward after being deemed mentally unstable. The woman in red paid her a visit, and heard the whole story from Akasuki's own mouth. The woman sipped at her coffee. Ever since that incident, all reports of bullying were taken extremely seriously, and anyone found to be a bully was punished severely. But anyway, my whole point is this. It's stupid to say that the school's haunted. With a pale face, one of the young girls pointed out that what had happened there was as good a reason as any for the school to become haunted. I had to agree. This was one of the most gruesome tales I'd ever heard in my life. But to that, the woman simply snapped. If you ask me, what Akasuki did was perfectly natural, given what happened at least. I mean, wouldn't you have done the same in her shoes? This is my parents' story, and it took place in Colorado many years ago, back before I was even born. They're both natives, and have always been a very superstitious pair. That might just have saved their lives that night. They were traveling along Million Dollar Highway through Red Mountain Pass after a long road trip. It was around 2 or 3 a.m., and my dad was behind the wheel while my mum slept in the passenger seat. They both knew the road well, and dad was driving cautiously. The road is notoriously dangerous for its lack of guardrails and sheer steep drops over the edge. At one point, dad nudges my mum awake. There's something not quite right about the road up ahead. After letting her eyes adjust for a moment, she too could see that the road ahead was different than usual. After having driven that road so many times, they both knew that the sharp left curve they were fast approaching was going the opposite way it should have been. This part of the road was meant to curve right around the mountain. Always had, always would. Even the sign they just passed said so. Neither of them knew what to say as they approached the bend in the road. They both rub their eyes, but they're not seeing things. The road really is turning left, not right. But that was impossible. The silence was killing them, and as they reached the point of no return, Mum screamed to turn right instead. She needn't have bothered, as Dad was already spinning the wheel in that direction knowing that was how the road was supposed to go. As he turned, the actual road seemed to appear before them, just how it had always been. The road that turned left was now just gone, as if it had never been there to begin with, and all that was left in its place was a sheer drop. Had they followed the illusionary road they both saw, they would have plunged over the side of the mountain. Dad maintains that this was some sort of trickster, trying to force them off the side of the cliff, and in to an early grave. This took place back in the summer of 2014, when I was 25 years old. I live in Germany, and at the time, I had just become interested in BDSM. Basically, the whole whips and chains deal. It's not for everyone, but more people are into it than you'd think. Something like 20% of people fantasize about it. So, if you have four other friends, chances are one of you is a secret sadomasochist. If it isn't you, then you can have some fun speculating about which of your pals it might be. The problem for me at the time was that it's not the easiest thing to experiment with especially when you're not in an established relationship. I don't think there's any smooth way to bring it up on a date or with girls at the bar, unless it's some sort of sex bar or something like that. That's when I had the bright idea to become a member of a fairly well-known BDSM website, just so I could finally chat about the subject with other like-minded people, and who knows, maybe see where things went from there. 
It was a surprisingly positive experience right off the bat. Everyone I chatted to was so friendly and welcoming. And I have to tell you, I learned more than a thing or two that doesn't bear repeating here. Like I said, I talked to quite a few people on the site, but one stood out. A redhead with a username that translates into Mistress Honey. She messaged me about two weeks into me becoming a member, saying that I was just her type and that she wanted to get to know me better. Scrolling through her photos, I was pleasantly surprised. Rocking body, pretty face, and from the thing she'd type, kinky as all hell. Jackpot. Over the course of a day or two, Mistress Honey told me that her real name was Yasmin, and that she thought I'd make a perfect subordinate. Someone she could dominate in the bedroom. Well, I don't know about you guys, but to me that sounded pretty good. Just what I was into. But I confessed that I wasn't really experienced with the whole BDSM thing, and since she seemed like she'd been around the block a few times, I might not be what she's looking for. She seemed to be really understanding, and eager to teach me all she knew. It genuinely was quite surprising how all these sadomasochists were actually really nice and welcoming, at least online. I tried to organise a meet-up between the two of us, but she was either never available or had to cancel last minute. She suggested one night that I should go over to her place for a night of fun instead skip the pleasantries and get straight down to business. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea, but I replied to her message asking for her address. I knew she lived close by, but didn't know exactly where. She sends it over, and it's only a 30 minute drive away. Perfect. Not so far as to be impractical, but far enough that if it goes awkwardly, it's not like I'm going to bump into her in the streets afterwards. I message her back, saying that I'll be at her place in the next hour or so. She replied with a winky face. Hopping in my car and tapping her details into my GPS, I'll admit that I was a little bit nervous about the upcoming encounter. Not because I foresaw trouble or anything, but because, honestly, it had been a while since I'd last been with a woman, and now I was diving headfirst into a world of latex. Still, I guess this was sink or swim time. And besides, she was going to be the dominant one during the course of the evening, which had to be the harder job in practice, right? All I had to do was endure a little whipping, a bit of handcuff burn, and just enjoy the ride. This and other thoughts were swirling in my head as I drove the route highlighted on the machine, until I was nearing my destination. It was a lot more rural than I had first anticipated. I carefully drove down this thin, country road, engulfed by trees so thick they blocked out all of the moonlight, my headlights the only thing illuminating my path. You have reached your destination. I pulled up outside this tatty-looking farmhouse. Now, this really wasn't what I was expecting. It was so secluded and abandoned-looking. There was still a fair amount of distance from my vehicle to the house, so still time to pull out. But something compelled me to stay. No prizes for guessing what that thing was. A three-letter word ending in X. A light was on in what I presumed was the bedroom, the top right window of the house. Looking up, I saw that the window blinds were parted ever so slightly, and a pair of female eyes were peering down at me through the slats. Well, she knows I'm here, I figured. Can't turn back now. Checking my phone one last time, she had dropped me a message saying that the door was open and to just come on inside. Like all her messages, it had ended in that winky face. Against my better judgement, I stepped out of the car and approached her front door. Sure enough, it was open, and with a push, I stepped into the small entranceway. 
It was almost pitch black inside. I could barely see a damn thing. Immediately, I was hit by the faint smell of latex. Whoa, she really was hardcore into this stuff. Not knowing whether it was breaking the roleplay immersion or not, I called out to Yasmin. Silence. Uh, Yasmin? I called out again, a little louder this time. Still, nothing. I fondled the wall in search of a light switch, but couldn't seem to find anything. Was she expecting me to just head to the bedroom right away? I paused and stood motionless for a moment, listening intently for any signs of movement in the house. From what I could tell, there was a slight moaning coming from upstairs. My mind was running wild with what she might be doing up there. Using the phone in my pocket as a light source, I slowly made my way up the stairs with trepidation, up to where I believed Yasmin was. I reached the top of the stairs. To my left, the hallway was completely black, and could have gone on forever for all I could tell. To my right was the door to Yasmin's bedroom, light seeping out from a crack in the slightly open door. This was definitely where the sounds were coming from, a tad louder now, and strangely distorted. I composed myself, let out an excited breath, and walked into the room. As soon as I entered, I knew I had made a massive mistake. By the window, strategically positioned, was a cardboard cutout of a female made to look as if it was peering out of the window shades. The walls were covered in magazine pages, calendars, and cutouts of scantily clad or naked women. All that was in the room was a massive bed, large straps and chains attached to the posts, a large camera on a tripod aimed at it. Next to it, a table holding a various selection of tools, ranging from sex toys to knives and other blades. The moaning was coming from a porn movie playing on a television set. What the actual fuck was this? Certainly not what I'd signed up for. I jumped like someone had lit a candle up my arse and 180 would as I left the bedroom and made for the stairs, I looked down the world's darkest hallway dead ahead of me, and stopped dead in my tracks. Frozen to the spot, I noticed something I hadn't when I first glanced down there before. The outline of a figure. A male figure. Hiding in the darkness, and creeping closer. No. Not one. Two. There were two people in the shadows. One standing upright, the other crawling on its knees. I could just about make them out now that they were closer to the light seeping out of the bedroom. As I stopped and stared at them, they both froze too. Who the fuck's there? I shouted. A thick, male voice replied with one word. Yasmin. I bolted down the stairs and out the front door at lightning speed, praying not to fall on my way to the car, and that there were no other surprises waiting for me outside. In what felt like a heartbeat, I was there and scrambling for my keys. I opened the driver's side door and threw myself in flicking on the headlights and preparing to make my getaway. My lights hit the house as I turned. In the doorway was a broad man who looked like Buffalo Bill, wearing a dress and holding a hammer. And I fuck you not, next to him was a gimp. A fucking gimp in one of those terrifying masks, charging out towards my vehicle as I reversed out of there his hands bound behind his back like he was some sort of animal. The other guy, Yasmin, was clearly the master. He stood in the doorway watching, as if he had just released the hounds on me, screaming for the gimp to not let me get away. 
he rammed into the side of my vehicle, his face up against the window. I could just about make out the whites of his crazed eyes behind the mask, and hear his muffled yells and laughing. He sounded like an absolute maniac. Dear God, I floored it. That gimp in full latex sprinted after me as I drove down the country road, heart beating a thousand times a second. Thankfully, he really was only human, underneath all that skin-tight black clothing, and he soon faded out of view in my mirrors as I put pedal to the metal. I drove home faster than was legal, cracked open a beer to take the edge off, and, after some thinking, decided to call the police. They eventually got around to checking the place out. Turns out, the gimp was a living slave. He allowed the other guy to keep him in a cage, feed him scraps, and treat him like crap, all by choice. He had been there for months. All of the footage on the video camera in the bedroom had conveniently been deleted. God knows what those guys were recording. They played dumb to the cops about the whole thing, saying that nobody had been over that night, and that I must be lying. The cops bought their story and let them be. I know for a fact that if I hadn't hightailed it out of there when I did, I would likely have found myself in the gimp's position, only against my will. Perhaps an even worse fate would have befallen me. Who knows? The whole scenario was just so sketchy. Two movies I can no longer watch? The Silence of the Lambs and Pulp Fiction. Damn, love those movies too. This is a story given to me by a friend of mine. He's a psychiatrist in Tokyo, and has helped, or at least tried to help, a lot of truly disturbed people. We were at a school reunion when he told me about a case he was working on. His subject was a woman who had recently been charged with assault. She was locked up, and it was my friend's job to analyse her mental condition. I think he only told me because we're really close friends, and because he was very, very drunk. I won't be revealing any names or anything, you know, confidentiality and whatnot, but he didn't technically say to me that I shouldn't tell the story to anyone either. Maybe it's because it's rather unbelievable. Honestly, I didn't really believe it either, but I asked him about it again when he was sober, and he confirmed that everything he said was true. Now, I've known this guy for 30 years, and he's never lied to me before, even when we've both been intoxicated out of our minds. But I asked for some written proof, which he actually provided me. This story comes from a written account that the woman made. She was either unable or unwilling to talk at the time, so had to write down her side of the story. It's highly unethical, but regardless... I've transcribed as much as I could, as best as I could, here. What? In that instant, I was stunned. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Break up? What did he mean, break up? I'd devoted the last few years of my life entirely to him. But why? I asked him. You're too heavy. Heavy? What do you mean by heavy? That I'm fat? I asked him. No, you're not fat. I mean, you're emotionally heavy. You're a mental burden. A mental burden? Everything I did with my time was for him. My cooking, my money, all of it was for him. How could that be a mental burden on him? I don't know how to say it. You're so clingy, so overprotective. You don't let me do anything myself. Sometimes I think you'd wipe my ass for me if I asked you to. What's wrong with that, Doctor? So many people would dream to have someone like that in their lives. A second mother. 
someone who will always look out for them and provide them their every need. It was all for him. Everything was for him. I'm sorry, darling, I cried. I'll do whatever it is you want me to do, please. All right then, get out of my sight. What? Then get out of my sight, as fast as possible. I was astounded. Is that what he wanted? I'd do anything to grant his wish, but then I wouldn't be able to see him ever again. No, no, that can't happen. I don't want that to happen, I thought to myself. I couldn't bear it anymore, and ran out of his room, crying. I sat outside in the park, swinging aimlessly on the swing set. I'm not very smart, but I racked my brain as hard as I could to work out how I could avoid the breakup. The best thing to do would be respect his wishes, but that would mean I'd have to leave him. That just couldn't happen. So, after some deep thinking, I came up with an idea. This was the only solution. No time like the present. I went to the local convenience store to buy what I needed. When I pressed the buzzer to his apartment, he almost immediately opened the door for me. Oh, what do you want? He asked. I want to make it up with you. I told you to stay out of my sight, he bellowed at me. I know. I'll fulfill your wish. I'd do anything for you. And with that, I quickly drew the screwdriver out of my pocket and plunged it into his right eye. At that point, he was rolling on the floor with agony. The poor little thing. I didn't want him to suffer for too long. It was easier the second time. He was on the floor after all. I perched on top of him and brought down the screwdriver again. It narrowly missed his left eye and slid into his left cheek, but it wasn't too difficult to slide the tool along his face and into the socket. Squelch is the sound I think it made. A cute sound, just like him. So, that's her account. Not all of it. Quite a lot of it was uninterpretable, according to my friend. Difficult to believe, right? Like I said, I didn't really believe him either. Not until I read this, at least. Then again, the fact he showed me this doesn't mean it's 100% true, either. This could have just been the ramblings of an imaginative but insane woman. But like I said, my friend's not much of a liar. Either way, I can kind of see her logic. The man asked her to get out of his sight, and technically, I suppose she did. This has haunted me for a long time. I was about 19 or 20 at the time, and I was living in Savannah, Georgia. I had a crappy fake ID, and I drank a lot. I worked this terrible job as a grunt laborer, the kind where you go to those temp labor agencies like Ablebody or Labor Finders. I'd show up at 4am, work until 5pm, and drink myself to sleep after only taking home maybe $60 for the day. I was supposed to go into work this particular morning, but I decided to skip it. It's a labor agency, they'll just find somebody else. I call my girlfriend and tell her I want to go to Tybee Beach. I had already started drinking. She comes over and we hop in my big ugly van pack up some rods, and head to the beach. I decided to have a drink across from the beach at this little bar. This is where the story gets interesting. Shortly after ordering my drink, I get this really weird feeling. I become hyper aware of my surroundings. The door opens, and I see this guy walk in out of my peripheral vision. There was a seat between me and my girlfriend, but it was like 9am, and the bar was completely empty. He could have sat anywhere else, yet he chooses to sit right between her and I. 
Then, he starts doing this thing with his fingers. The bar top was reflective, and he takes his fingers like two little legs, and just starts walking with them, skating them on the top of the counter. This isn't something out of the ordinary, but I took notice, because when I was in school, I did that all the time. I pretended I had rollerblades on my fingers, and that I was skating around my desk. I hated school, and was always distracting myself. So I'm watching him do this, and I became kind of mesmerized for some reason. That's when he looks at me, and in this really thick, kind of Germanic or Nordic accent, he says, I notice you're a man who pays attention to details. Me too. Now, before I continue, I have to describe this guy. He had this short, spiky hair with bleached tips, kind of like a late 90s style. He had really expensive clothes on. A nice Prada leather jacket, nice designer jeans, really nice boots. He seemed like a kind of gay guy with really awesome fashion sense and really distinctive taste. I always remember this, because I think to myself, some weird homeless crazy guy couldn't afford clothes like that. The other thing that stuck out were his eyes. They were piercing grey. It reminded me of a husky's eyes, but his pupils just stayed this disturbing pinpoint size. They were just extremely small, which caused his look to be kind of terrifying. His teeth were normal, right? But not at the same time. I don't know how to explain it. They were sharper than they should be, as if they had been filed slightly. His hands were normal, but his fingernails were slightly long and pointed, as if he deliberately did it. He kept licking his teeth too, as if he were salivating. The thing about this guy is that you look at him, and everything seems normal, but off at the same time. So you're left questioning if you're crazy for thinking this. This guy then begins to start talking about the relationship between me and my girlfriend, but really strangely. He's talking about how beautiful she is, and how I should pay her more attention. He admittedly, I was kind of a dick to her. Shortly after he began talking like this, I had this almost knowing feeling come over me. Like, I knew this guy wasn't human. I look at my girlfriend and say, you need to leave. She just kind of looks at me like she knows too. Without a word of protest, she gets up quietly and leaves. Later I learned that she went next door to get a coffee. That's when this guy literally says to me with the utmost confidence, you were supposed to go fishing today. He points at the beach across the street. If you had, I would have drowned you in that ocean. And I shit you not, he fucking hissed at me. Again, for some reason, this overwhelming calm had come over me. I just ask, who are you? He answers back with this crazy, guttural language. It sounded Arabic or Hebrew or something. For some reason, without skipping a beat, and I have no idea why I was so calm to this day, I just ask, say it in a way I can understand. <laughs> uh, you can call me Jimmy C. I jumped off the San Francisco Bridge years ago, and we've been watching you. From there on out, he never referred to himself as me or I, only we. The conversation became something very strange after this. He kept buying me drinks too, specifically whiskey sours. It was like he had an endless supply of money. He smoked Marlboro Ultra Light cigarettes. After I don't know how long, because I lost sense of time, I told him I'm going to leave. I walk next door to get my girlfriend, and she's stone silent. We start driving home, 
don't say a word. Then I just ask her, do you know what that was? Yeah, that was a demon. This girl had parents that were scientists. She was really analytical, completely non-religious, and that was the first thing out of her mouth. Now, I didn't say this part before, because to me, this is the most important aspect of the story, because it's what happened after this that really screwed me up for fucking years. The last thing this Jimmy C guy said to me before I left is this. Look at my car. I look outside and see one of those newer Volkswagen Beetles. It was white. What does the license plate say? I look at the plate and it literally says, Fierce. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, The next time you see me, I'll be driving a black Mercedes, and the license plate will say Utopia. Stupid, right? That night, I was still calm. I don't know why. I felt like that guy on office space after his hypnotherapist died right in front of him, and he was weirdly zen. My girlfriend started having terrible nightmares of this guy's head just staring at her in her dreams. Weeks went by, and that's when the encounter started affecting me. I found myself becoming paranoid about that black fucking Mercedes. Every black car I saw, I checked if it was a Mercedes. If it was, I immediately looked at the license plate. I started doing it when I was watching TV or movies as well. Now, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. About 10 years go by. I'm 29, so this is just recently. When I'm alone, when I'm drinking, I often think about this encounter. I still look at black Mercedes every time they pass, but I'm not so much anxious anymore, but curious. I remembered that my girlfriend at the time always kept a journal. By now, I'm pretty sure I'm insane. Maybe I was drunk. Maybe I'm not remembering any of this correctly. After years of trying to find news articles of a Jimmy C that committed suicide off the San Francisco Bridge, years of looking at black cars and so on, I felt like I'd grown out of it, so to speak. Yet still, I had to know. So, last year, I tracked down my ex-girlfriend. We ended on bad terms. I find out she's a schoolteacher in Wisconsin, has married a woman, and is actually trying to have a child. I figure she's not going to talk to me, but I send her a Facebook message anyway. I ask her if she could find the journal from that day, because I have to know if her events line up with mine. Sure enough, she had it. It verified everything I remembered, and it contained even more details than I recalled because she had written it at that coffee shop right after it happened. When I read what she had written literally that day, I knew I wasn't imagining the details wrong, that this actually happened. This is probably the single most frustrating and scary thing that has ever happened to me. I want to imagine it's just a normal, crazy guy, but unless you saw it, felt it, and heard him talk about all of the little details of what you were supposed to do on that day, when only you knew it, you just can't understand the impact of it. It's been ten years, and my only solace, really, is that my ex-girlfriend was there to corroborate. That communication, where I reached out to her, actually caused us to be on good terms again after a decade. It seems to have been something that bothered her just as much as it bothered me. And still, to this day, even though I'm living 10,000 miles away in Southeast Asia, I can't stop thinking about Jimmy C's twisted face. I wonder if he still crawls on my back, and if the fear I feel at night, often to where I have to drink myself to sleep or find a one-night stand just to not feel alone, is him or them.
watching me. I used to work as a 911 operator in a relatively large metro area. One night, at about three in the morning or so, I answered a call from an elderly woman who said she didn't feel good. I tried to get more information about what was wrong. Chest pain, trouble breathing, headache, is she a diabetic, and so on. She gave me her address and phone number, and said no one else was home but that the front door was unlocked so they could come right in. I toned the call out as general illness, and kept trying to get more details. No matter what else I asked about what was wrong, all she would say was, I just don't feel good. Can you send someone to help me? After a few minutes, she said, I'm gonna put the phone down for a minute. I need to go to the bathroom. I tried to get her to stay on the line with me, told her she could do whatever she needs to do to get ready, but I'd like to be able to stay in contact in case there's a problem. She said, I'm gonna put the phone down, I'll just be a minute. And that was it. I stayed on the line and asked for her every so often, but got no reply. A couple more minutes passed, and then the fire department called on scene, so I just disconnected and didn't think much more about it. Told them that the caller advised the front door was unlocked, and that she was in the bathroom. A couple more minutes, and one of the firefighters called over the air with a weird tone. Dispatch, uh, how exactly was this call received? I told them the call was first party from the patient's home phone, approximately eight minutes ago. He didn't respond over the air, but called the desk from his cell phone, which usually only happens when something's going on that they don't want broadcasted, since anyone can listen in on the radios. On the phone, he said, Are you sure this wasn't a third party call from a family member or something? Negative. Caller advised I don't feel good, and said no one else was home. So, to the best of my knowledge, the caller is the patient. Have you made contact? Yeah. She was in the bathroom like you said. But she's probably been dead for around 12 hours. Cold to the touch. Fully livid. Full rigor. We're gonna need a deputy out here. Afterwards, we pulled the tapes of the radio and phone calls, checked the timestamps, address, phone number, went over everything a few times to see if we'd missed something. I called them back in the morning after the shift to see if they had any more information, but they were just as weirded out as we were. The phone was still in the living room, and the patient was dead in the bathroom. On the way back from work, I would always pass by this creepy apartment complex. No one had been living there for years, and there were plans for the building to be demolished in a couple of months. This abandoned apartment was a hotspot for people who wanted to commit suicide. It was an isolated place with few houses nearby, and the building was high enough for the fall to be lethal. Word on the street was that this place was haunted. Us Japanese have always been a superstitious bunch, especially when it comes to suicide sites. We have more than our fair share. Since there were almost no houses nearby, there were no shops or streetlights either. It was a terrifying place to cycle past. It was a mid-December night, and the snow was falling thick and fast. Absolutely freezing, I pedalled my bike as fast as possible from the station to my house in the pitch blackness. I had nothing but my bike light to guide my path. As I neared the abandoned apartment, I stopped pedalling. There was a single light shining from the top of the building. I gulped. Was it a ghost? The soul of someone who had committed suicide? I didn't want to go near the building 
but this was the only path that I could take to get back to my house. If I wanted to take a different route, it would require me to head all the way back to the station. The whole journey would take me an extra hour. It was freezing cold, and as another gust of snowy air hit me in the face, I made my mind up and pedaled slowly towards the apartment. As I came closer to the building, I realized that the light was not that of a ghost or soul, but was obviously a torch or a lamp. I suppose it could have also been the light off of someone's phone. Sighing in relief, I was about to cycle past when I heard a bone-chilling scream. It was a woman. The screaming continued until there was a resounding thud, as if something had slammed onto the pavement. A fresh gust of cold air erupted all around me. A woman had just thrown herself off the building. At first, I was frozen in fear, but it didn't take me long to spring into action. I rushed over to the foot of the building and found the girl who had jumped, gasping for breath and shaking in agony. Her limbs were shattered and contorted, and claret seeped from her mouth as she looked up at me, pure terror in her eyes. The bloodstained snow around her cushioned her landing, so the fall hadn't killed her instantly like she planned. Instantly, I pulled out my phone and called for help. I thought it was futile at the time. This girl was going to die in the next few minutes without proper medical assistance. All the same, I told her that everything was going to be okay, and to just hold on a little longer. At least she wouldn't die alone. It wasn't long until the whole area was full of red, blue, and white light. The girl was in a critical state, but unlike all of those that had jumped before her, she actually managed to survive. This whole ordeal was easily the scariest moment of my entire life, but not because of the girl, and not because I was so sure she was going to die. You see, as I knelt by the girl's side, freezing in the snow, waiting for the ambulance to arrive, I realized that she wasn't staring up at me, but was looking just past me, up at the apartment building. Several of the apartment's lights were now on. In the windows were people staring down at us. The complex seemed to be filled with light, sound and movement just before the ambulance arrived. Both she and I saw them, their bloody, emaciated faces inviting her in. The building's gone now, but I still take a different route home from work. This took place in Rhode Island when I was much younger, back in my college days. This was on the local Rhode Island news, so if you tried hunting, I'm sure you could find it. I was dating a girl that went to school in a town I won't name. It was the summer and everyone was back home. My girlfriend's best friend had an internship back in that town, and this girl had a four-bedroom multi-family home to herself. The other three roommates were paying for their rooms, but chose to stay home. I guess they could only get this place if they started paying the rent two to three months prior to school starting, but whatever. One weekend, my girlfriend asks me to go to that town with her to spend some time with her friend. She's lonely and has nothing to do on the weekends. We're only like an hour away, so it sounds like a plan. We head down, and we just chill for the night. It's about 2am, and we decide to walk out and get some cigs. Nothing special. We walk by a guy on our way home from the gas station, and he's just staring at us. Kind of creepy, but no big deal. This wasn't the best of areas, but certainly not the worst. We eventually all pass out and me and my girlfriend head home the next day. The end of the week comes, and my girlfriend asks if I want to go and visit her friend again, but I have to work all weekend, so I decline. She heads down there alone, 
and her friend's boyfriend is coming over to stay as well. Pretty much a repeat of the weekend before. They all drink, but end up going out and partying a little bit. They're walking back after a night of drinking when they enter the mudroom at around 2am. The mudroom door had been left unlocked. They close it behind them, and there's a really raggedy looking dude in there waiting for them. He says out loud to them, Get in the fucking house. They all turn around, and he has a gun. My girlfriend's friend has already unlocked the door to the house, and it's partially opened. Everyone is frozen in place, and the guy repeats himself, Get in the fucking house. The boyfriend then steps forward with his hands up a little bit, trying not to seem confrontational. Hey man, calm down. It's all good. I don't know how the fuck this dude was brave enough to do any of this. As he says that, the intruder shoots him. My girlfriend and her friend run into the house and hide under a bed. They can't hear this, but the assailant took off and didn't follow them back in. They don't know this though, and they're terrified, hiding under a bed while the boyfriend is screaming for help. They think the psycho's in the house and is looking for them. My girlfriend told me they were both silently crying under the bed while the boyfriend screamed for help. The worst part was that he was yelling, Help me, I'm dying. The neighbours heard the gunshot and screaming, and they called the police. They ended up catching the dude. He'd been watching the girl for weeks. It was the guy we had seen watching us the week prior. Worst part was, the girl's boyfriend didn't make it. This isn't my story, but my grandma's. She told me this story after I shared an equally horrific tale of my own. I might get around to sharing that one soon. My grandmother is a part of the time period when lots of southerners were migrating to the northern states, looking for work and better pay to help out their families still living down south. This took her to New York, where she found seamstress work, and where this story takes place. I should also add that my grandma is a tough old bird, and she's very paranoid about people she doesn't really know, and situations she has no control over. So this story came as a bit of a shock to me, and kind of explains a little about why she might be so paranoid. I'll also add that she doesn't and never has taken any shit from anyone. She's about 5 foot 9, had muscles in her 60s, still rocks a crew cut and would kick some ass if necessary. She's not a typical granny at all, so if something scares her, it's really fucking scary. So, my grandma and her friend Judy worked down the street from each other. They were introduced by my grandma's boss, and hit it off pretty well, and they started hanging out frequently after work. My grandma said that one night they went out to a bar, just having a good old time. It was here that the men approached them. There were two of them, one tall and light-skinned, and the other shorter and darker. Judy seemed to know them, and seemed to be happy to see them. She introduced them to my grandma, and they all decided to hang out for the evening. After a while of drinking and having a good time in the bar, the men started asking Judy if her and her beautiful friend would like to come back to their house to continue the party, since the bar was going to be closing soon. My grandma declined, as she's always been paranoid, and she said the men were giving off creepy vibes all night, doing stuff like whispering when they thought her and Judy weren't paying attention, giving the general creeper stare, and the short dark man kept trying to touch my grandma's waist and wrist. She said he was ugly as hell, that he looked like an old screw-faced beagle in her own words, and that he was so short she practically towered over him. At one point, he tried to hold her hand, and she gave him her I'll fucking kill you face, and he let go. 
The tall man persisted with the after-party idea, saying they could go and play cards and dance some more at their big, nice house. He promised others would be there as well to party and play cards. Judy, by this time, was tanked, and the man had her convinced. But she didn't want to go without my grandma, so she proceeded to beg my grandma to come with her. She tells my grandma to stop being so paranoid and to trust her, that these guys are her friends and that they're okay. So my grandma, against her better judgement, left with them. My grandma says they drove for a good long while, and the moment she looked out of the car window and didn't recognise anything at all, she asked the man where they were going, and all he said was, Upstate. That was when she knew she was probably in trouble. The two men sat in front, and her and Judy were in the back. Judy's telling my grandma to chill out, that they're gonna have a good time. They get to the place, and it turns out the guys didn't lie. They pull up in front of a nice big house in some suburb. They go inside, and grandma says she remembers the front door led into some long, dimly lit hallway. They were all walking in single file down the hallway in this order. The tall man, Judy, grandma, short man. She says that at the end of the hallway there was a door that they went to, and the tall man had to stop to open the door with a key. As they waited for him to do so, she saw a big rat in a spare room off the hall run across a dirty mattress with horrible brown stains all over it. She says that this is what initially creeped her out about the house. The stains looked like dried blood, and the mattress was the only thing in the room just lying in the middle of the floor. So, they're all waiting for the tall man to open the door, and my grandma is about two seconds from losing her shit. He finally gets it open. My grandma said she barely got a glimpse into the room. The door pulled out towards them, so she could see through the crack where the hinges and the frame meet. There were women of all ages in the nude, Lingerie, garters, laying all over the furniture, playing cards and smoking cigarettes with men. She also heard someone screaming. My grandma screamed as well, and turned and ran, knocking the short man down in the process. She was so much taller than him that she barely noticed she'd run him over. The tall man had already grabbed Judy, who was now screaming too and, with the help of another man, shoved her inside the room with the other women and slammed the door. He then turned to help the short man chase down my grandma. She said she could hear them behind her, yelling things like, Catch that bitch, and that they'd kill her when they caught her. She managed to get down the hall and out of the door, and she ran down the street screaming because she didn't know where she was, or where a train station was to get away. By the grace of God, she ran into a little old man who was opening a newsstand. He asked her what was going on, and when she pointed at the men, he pulled out a gun and started yelling at them to get the fuck away. Thankfully, they hightailed it back to wherever. The newsstand man helped her find a train station, and gave her money to help her get back to the city. My grandma never saw Judy again. Her boss told her one day that a nice looking man came by and picked up all of her belongings from her place of work, which was also where she lived. Said he told them that Judy wouldn't be returning to work, and that she had found a new place to stay. In a nutshell, my grandma avoided being abducted into a human trafficking ring. She says this has been going on for longer than the world wants to admit. For those of you who ask why she didn't call the police, you have to understand. My grandma didn't know where they took her, or if she had been given real names. She didn't know the address or anything that would have helped her find Judy. Also, being black and from Alabama back then, she didn't have much faith that the police would do anything to help her 
and was afraid of what the men might do to her for meddling. She wishes she could have convinced Judy not to go along that night, and for a long time felt guilty about being the only one who got away. I'm glad she did though. I wouldn't exist if they had caught her. My girlfriend suffers from pretty intense night terrors and sleep paralysis, and has done since she was a kid. Usually, they're about a shadow man at the foot of her bed, or snakes in her room. It gets to the point where she scares herself so badly, she bruises herself while dreaming. She's had some small terrors before, and I'm usually able to calm her down quickly, convince her that nothing's really there and she just goes back to sleep. We recently celebrated Valentine's Day by getting a hotel room, along with some pizza, some candy, and some beer, and just relaxed the night away. Everything went great, and when we finally go to sleep, I'm out like a light. Fifteen minutes after I pass out, she whispers quietly, There's someone in the room with us. I can see him. He's right there. Now, this hotel wasn't exactly the nicest, and it wasn't in the best area, but I had felt safe. I assumed it was just another one of her night terrors. She then starts screaming that he's coming closer, so at this point I bolt awake, and it's much, much darker in the room than it was when I went to bed. I flick the light on, and no one's there, but my girlfriend is sobbing, curled up on the bed. With my heart racing, but still unconcerned, I checked the room to calm her down. I checked everywhere, including under the bed. When I went into the bathroom, my blood went cold. The window was open about three inches when I specifically remembered closing it before I went to bed, and neither one of us had got up during the night. I didn't tell her about the window, cuddled her close, and didn't sleep at all for the rest of the night. I made sure that the knife I keep in my emergency kit was well within reach on the nightstand. Growing up in the mountains of North Georgia, camping and hiking were things my brother and me did so often it became second nature. Any time Ryan and I had a break from school, we'd head out straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were going, and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midways through Jack's River Trail in Kohata Wilderness, and it's a trail we knew fairly well since we'd used it a few times before to practice long hikes. We arrived at the trailhead around lunchtime, parked the car, got out our gear, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as we moved along and asked them how the trail looked, and the answer was always the same. Wet. Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17 mile journey, and with the colder temperatures of late fall setting in, it was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, me and Ryan have this rule. We don't camp near people if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods never to be seen again. So, we always camped a pretty decent ways off the trail, and in the area that wasn't popular with overnight camping. After roughly two and a half hours or so, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights that we'd be out. We came up to Horseshoe Bend and ventured about half a mile off the trail into a clearing and set up. We built a TP fire lay for that night. After setting up and unloading, we decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around many of the swimming holes Jack's River had to offer. 
This was during Thanksgiving break, and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather, or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking, much less staying the night. Around 5 o'clock, Ryan and I headed back to our camp to start our fire, make dinner, and settle in for the night. As soon as the sun began to set, the cold rushed in. We added more wood to the fire, sat close, and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior and he was a sophomore, but growing up, we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, had the same hobbies. Around 9pm, we're settling comfortably around the fire. I just text our mum to let her know we were safe and settling down. And I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving, when things started getting strange. We were no strangers to sounds in the woods, and these woods were full of animals, from deer to black bears, and even the random wild boar. If you're in the woods enough, you learn to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing, I can only chalk up to as odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like someone sneaking around slowly, just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs, you hear a tighter group of steps, but what we were hearing sounded like a human walking slowly, or trying to move without making much noise. We both pulled out our flashlights and shone them in the direction we thought the sounds were coming from. But that's what's so weird. Whenever we'd fix our lights on the spot, the sound would suddenly change, as if it was multiple people walking around us. That's when the whistling started. At first, I thought it was the wind, and I remember thinking maybe the wind is just throwing leaves around, and what we thought we were hearing was nothing but the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me, and asked if I was hearing it too. I didn't answer, and was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes, with roughly a three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes, over and over again. Ryan kept asking me if I heard it, and I put my finger to my lips, trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight. My fist clenched, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there, if it was anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever. That's when Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness. Hey! Quiet. The whistling stopped. The crunching of the wood stopped. Nothing. I was pissed. I looked at Ryan with a what-the-hell look, and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few minutes, when the woods erupted with noise. Something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. The whistling came back. Two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes again. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking, while running at the same time? I was done. I stood up, shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now, this is the part I'll never forget, the part I never like to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with the dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on, I stepped around the fire towards my tent. 
Inside my bag, I had a 6 inch fixed blade that I always carried, and thought I'd feel a bit more comfortable with it in my hand. More so than just with my flashlight at least. As I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes towards the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up in front of me, and for maybe two seconds, I saw it. Whatever this person, or thing, was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance, or landed in a thicket, because I heard it but never saw it. I don't think I've ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw, but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about it. Maybe ten minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view, asking if everything was okay. I settled a bit, and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything. All they said was they heard a lot of movement, and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit, came back, and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we had called the police, and roughly 30 minutes later, a park ranger showed up. Ryan and I tried to explain everything to him, but he just chalked it up to some curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I decided we weren't staying the night. We packed our stuff up and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement, and we got in our car and drove home. Ryan and I don't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail, and probably never will go back. My brother, cousins and I used to play a game whenever we had a sleepover. It was simple. We'd stay up and scare the living fuck out of each other. When we were at Erin and Kyle's house, it was the scariest by far. Her house was haunted. That's what everyone said. Even her parents knew it. Don't worry about Mr. Toombs, they'd say. He's harmless. Then they'd laugh and go back to what they were doing. Mr. Toombs was the man who owned the house before Erin's parents. He died all alone, and no one realised he was gone until many months later. Even though the house got gutted and renovated before it went on the market, we had this feeling he had died in the basement right near the furnace. The air there just felt thick and heavy, like old sour breath. We'd have our sleepovers a few times a month, our parents all worked at the same factory. Whenever they had to take third shift, we'd either stay at home and Erin and Kyle would come to our house, or Greg and I would go over to Erin and Kyle's. I never minded all the moving around, until Kyle said we had to play that game. I hated it. Kyle was the oldest, and could be mean if he wanted to. He wasn't a bully. He usually knew when to back off, and genuinely felt bad if he made one of us cry. But he still liked to get his way, and that meant we'd have to play the sleeping game. The first time we played the sleeping game, we were at our house. The four of us were in our sleeping bags in the living room, and Kyle started to tell a really terrifying story about a skinny alien that comes through the window and cuts you up in your bed. Greg, Erin, and I hated the story, but I could tell Erin was especially horrified. She was only six. I kept telling Kyle to take it easy on his sister, but he was relentless. To Erin's credit, she didn't cry, but I think that was the problem. 
he probably would have stopped if she had. The game went like this. After the story, you weren't allowed to get out of your sleeping bag. No matter how scared you were, you couldn't get up to get water, you couldn't go to the bathroom, and under no circumstances could you run upstairs to get comfort from the grown-ups. If you did, you'd have to get an Indian burn from the rest of the group. The night of the alien story, I couldn't stop looking at the living room windows. Whenever a car went by and cast its lights against the wall, I'd shiver and feel my balls drawing up into my body while goosebumps rose on the back of my neck. Stupid Greg and Kyle were already asleep. Erin, whose sleeping bag was next to mine, was crying to herself. I need to pee, she whispered and I'm too scared to get up, and I don't want to get an Indian burn when I get back. I looked at Greg and Kyle. They were both completely out. Go ahead, I whispered. I won't tell anyone. Erin gave me a tight-lipped smile and snuck out of her sleeping bag and padded down the hallway. Right around the time when I'd assumed I would hear the bathroom door close, she screamed. It was a shrill, horror-filled explosion from her tiny lungs, and the three of us, now wide awake, vaulted from our sleeping bags in her direction. We got there a couple of seconds before my parents were thundering down the steps. They flipped on the lights. Erin was in the corner of the bathroom, sobbing. Her pajama pants were soaked. Mum picked her up and held her to her chest, and asked her what happened. The alien... Erin whimpered, then pointed to the shower curtain. Dad opened it. Nothing was there. Oh, it was just a shadow, honey, Dad told her. He glared at us. Come with me, boys, he ordered, and brought us back into the living room while Mum drew a bath for Erin. After a long lecture from my father, we agreed to not tell any more scary stories. Erin eventually came back to her sleeping bag, and with Dad snoring on the couch, we all went to sleep. The next night, of course, brought more stories. They were much tamer, though. Greg told a dumb one about a lady who gets pulled into a grave by a killer. I told an even worse one about some teenager whose baby brother's head came off. Erin actually laughed at that one it was so bad. We got ready to go to sleep still bound by the agreement that we couldn't get up for any reason until it was morning. At some point, in the middle of the night, Greg shook me awake. Hey, we caught Erin coming back from the bathroom. She was already rubbing her arm in discomfort from the burn her brother gave her. Greg grabbed her other one and twisted, making Erin yelp. I took her arm and just squeezed it a little bit. I felt bad. Months went by, and we played the sleeping game every time we were together. Everyone got caught at least once trying to sneak out. The Indian burns were had by all. Erin, though, got the most. It was obvious she wasn't having any fun. To make matters worse, she looked exhausted on the mornings after we played. I brought it up to Kyle, and he thought about it for a minute and then said we'd do it once a month instead of every time. I didn't argue. We kept our little agreement to ourselves, because we didn't want Erin to think we were treating her like a baby. That night, we were sleeping at their house. They had a beautifully furnished basement with a big screen TV, a ping pong table, and all sorts of other fun stuff. We set up our sleeping bags and played video games until well after 10pm. My aunt came down and said to turn it all off and to get some sleep, so we made like we were getting ready for bed. But when the lights went off, Kyle said it was time to play the sleeping game. I groaned, but he shot me a look and mouthed only one to me. At least he was holding up his end of the bargain. Like we always did, Anyone who needed to get up and pee or get a drink beforehand was allowed to. I went, followed by Kyle, and then Erin. We all came back. 
in the glow of the flashlight he liked to hold under his chin when he told his stories, Kyle started to talk about a ghost. The ghost. Mr. Toombs. Even Greg looked uncomfortable as he stared at the slatted wooden door, which served as a barrier between the furnished and unfurnished cellar. The furnace was on the other side. Mr. Toombs waits until you're asleep, Kyle whispered, and sucks your breath into his lungs. The longer you sleep, the more he takes away, and if you sleep for too long, you won't have any air left to breathe, and you'll be dead. My eyes were wide with fear, and Greg just stared at the ground. Kyle too looked like he'd successfully startled himself, especially when the furnace kicked on, and we all jumped. Erin, surprisingly, had actually managed to go to sleep first, despite bawling her eyes out by the end of the story, and making Carl promise to give her his snacks at lunch, or else she'd tell on him. I snuck her one of the lifesaver candies I'd stashed away to help her feel better. I guess it worked. The rest of us tried to go to sleep. Kyle caught me getting up to pee and gave me a wicked Indian burn. But since he caught me while he was on his way to the bathroom himself, I was able to reciprocate. Hard. He punched me in the arm, and I swatted him in the balls. I won. We tiptoed back into the basement, and got in our sleeping bags. It was the worst night's sleep I'd ever had. Each time the furnace kicked on, I knew I'd see Mr. Toombs floating above my sleeping bag ready to suck the life out of me. Like always, my aunt came downstairs in the morning to wake us up for school. She started with gentle calls, then hollers, then shouts. Then, since we always ignored her, she stomped down the stairs and threatened to haul us out of the sleeping bags. Let's go, she ordered. Get dressed and go get your breakfast. Erin, if I have to ask you again, I'm gonna flush your goldfish. Erin didn't budge. I swear to God, Erin, Goldine's going down into the sewer with the Ninja Turtles in three, two, one. Nothing. Concern flashed across my aunt's face. Kyle, who'd been sleeping next to her, shook his sister. She didn't respond. My aunt rushed across the room and pulled Erin to her. She hung limply out of the sleeping bag. Everything went really fast for a while. The ambulance came, while my aunt and uncle screamed and cried, and Kyle, Greg and I just sat there in stunned silence. My parents arrived soon after. They were also crying. We were all asked if we saw her drink any alcohol or take any medicine. None of us had. I knew Erin had been the last one to use the bathroom before bed. So I mentioned that. Someone went into the bathroom and returned with an empty bottle of sleeping pills that had been in the medicine cabinet. Through her tears, my aunt insisted that the bottle had been empty to begin with, that she'd been saving it so she could remember which kind had worked for her so she could get it again. But there was no other explanation at the time. Erin was dead. There was a funeral. It was terribly sad. But I went on with my life. Everyone did. I learned years later that the toxicology reports had been negative, and Erin's death had been ruled as accidental asphyxiation. They blamed the sleeping bag, and my aunt and uncle sued for millions. When Greg was moving out before his first year at college, I was asked to help him load the van. I didn't want to, but I helped anyway. Some of the heavier things were boxed up in the unfinished part of the cellar, by the furnace. I went down, and tried not to think about poor Erin. When I opened the door and entered the warm furnace room, I remembered that feeling I got the first time I'd been in there. An image of Mr. Toombs decaying next to the furnace flashed in my head. I shivered. But then I noticed the familiar, strange heaviness in the air. I noticed the smell. 
It was different from the sour odour that had reminded me of the last breath trapped inside a corpse's rotting lungs. This smell was sweet. It was cloying, like the breath of someone who'd eaten a lime lifesaver. The best things happen in the dark.